Okay, we're back here. This is SiliconAngle.com, exclusive coverage of Riley Media at Strata Conference. We're in the heart of Silicon Valley in Santa Clara, California for the Strata Conference. This is uh, SiliconAngle and Wikibon's co-produced event with O'Reilly Media. This is our new segment where we drill down on the top news here at Strata Conference on day two. I'm joined with my co-host Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. Go to Wikibon.org for all the free research on anything to do with big data and enterprise technology, all the emerging trends. We offer free research there. And of course, go to SiliconAngle.com for all the all the latest and greatest in this show, uh, RSA, other events happening, all the most important stories are happening on siliconangle.com. Of course, if you're watching live, you can watch the reruns on youtube.com slash siliconangle. Dave, this is an hour, our news hour, our power, news hour, our prime time. Um, top story today is the Hadoop Wars are on. Uh, we heard Ed Dunbell, program chair, say, I'm sick and tired of, of all this bickering between distributions. There's a big swath of biz value creation, but the top story again today is the Hadoop Wars are on for distributions. Your comments and analysis of that. Yeah, I mean, I can understand why Ed's saying that, but the fact is that if somebody's going to announce a, a distribution, the world is going to say, well, why? Why do we need another one? And I think, I have to say, when I look at WAN Disco, I look at Intel, I look at, at Green Plum, there are definite reasons as to why they're doing it. Right? When Disco's dealing with the active active problem and, and mission critical data, Intel, in my view, is really going hard after a security issue, which the world needs. Green Plum is, you know, doing EMC's thing. They're trying to get their slice of the pie. So um, I think that ultimately it's not going to matter when we look back on this, but there are going to be winners that emerge and they're going to be losers. And I think that. Uh, Do you think uh, Green Plum overplayed their hand? So I think Greenplum overplayed their I mean, hand. I mean, I think that we had Hortonworks on with Microsoft uh, <coughs> saying, hey, we're going after SQL Server. We have you know, Excel and other tools out there as well for business intelligence. That's fine, it's a marketplace. Greenplum is basically going after the data warehousing market. I, I mean, think, um, there's not much more than that. I mean. I think if, if you use a poker analogy, they've got to they've have a little bluff on <laughs> because you know, they've got to really puff up their chest and, and make, make the world think that uh, they're number one at this, right? And that's what EMC does. So um, I think uh, if that's what you mean by overplay their hand, yeah, uh, I think, I think well, it's a we smart don't know, move. We, we don't know what's under there, pocket <laughs> aces or? <laughs> yeah, well, right, exactly. So I think that's, uh, I, I think if, that, if that's the strategy, that's a good one, frankly, from a marketing and positioning standpoint. But I do think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the key question that comes back, John, is is there going to be a red hat of Hadoop? that emerges, and, and I, when we asked uh, Pat Gelsing that question, he said no, there won't be. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean there's not a big opportunity? No, in my view, that doesn't mean there's not a big opportunity. What that means is we're not going to, we, EMC, IBM, et cetera, are not going to let the world run away, <laughs> you know, or Red Hat, the, the Hadoop world run away the way Red Hat did. We're actually going to start participating, and hey, the Red Hat has a $10 billion market value, and we want a piece of that action. Other top stories here uh, at uh, Strata Conference is the sequel meets Hadoop. We had that segment on this morning. We had Ed Dunbill on the chair talking about uh, the data science being an art and more design focused, all the way down to the, to the scientific and high performance computing and everything in between. Um, we also had uh, introduced two new concepts here uh, we've gathered from the show. One is data as code, which really talks about the developer framework around big data. And the question on the table was, how can I use my unstructured data? Is it, how do I deal with data quality, data governance, data stewardship? And what's come out of that conversation here at Strata is that the developer community needs to be enabled to act on that code to get the insights, and that's what we call data as code. And the, also, the other concept that came out of Strata today that's newsworthy is this notion of uh, shadow data. Like shadow IT has been an, an, an emerging innovation for IT, although kind of in the shadows with Amazon, you're seeing the concept of shadow data, Dave, really hit the mark here, and we're hearing rumblings that this trend is catching some steam, and obviously we're reporting on that exclusively here on theCUBE, uh, and that's really, really cool. Validated by IBM's tweet chat. Yep. We had IBM on this morning on a tweet chat, mm -hmm. validating that from their standpoint, this data as code and shadow data is real. We've cross-validated it here at Strata. Yeah, you know, John, I put this in the category of uh, boring but important. We participated in that tweet chat this morning, and, it's, and not a lot of people talk about just sort of the management of, of big data, the governance of big data. Uh, and so the, the first question really is, okay, do the concepts that we use in the enterprise, do they apply to big data? And I think there's no question that they apply. Things like data quality and, and, and obviously security, who's got access to data, being able to audit that, having some kind of taxonomical you know, framework for your data so that you can defensively delete it or not, or you can hold it. And all those concepts apply, but they don't 
apply in the same way that's which we've implied them you know, technically and organizationally in the past. Why? Because we've got so much data, it's so much faster, the, the, the texture of the data is so much more diverse, so we really need new thinking and probably new technologies to solve this data management problem. Now the other thing I'd say, John, is I don't think it was solved in the traditional enterprise. You know? So I think it's going to be less solved in the big data world. So there's a huge opportunity there. Well that's why I get worried about some of these siloed approaches. But again, this, the, the world is coming back to uh, a theme that we drilled down on at Oracle Open World a few years ago, which is purpose-built um, solutions versus multi multi-general purpose or multi-vendor supported. So obviously even here, you got, you know, I'm going to build a purpose-built solution. We heard, you know, Greenplum's announcement. We heard Ed talk about Facebook. Building a software drives the data center design. Really interesting, right? So, so, you know, I don't think they're mutually exclusive and that's what I find very, very interesting. So what was your take on the, on the tweet chat? I mean, you were very active in there, kind of holding court there for a while. Um, <laughs> what was your takeaways? Well, I mean, first of all, I love doing tweet chats because it's an emerging environment where you got crowdsourced data opportunities, but it's still early. I think we're building some tools, but I'm really, really impressed with IBM because IBM has a lot of DNA in big data um, because as I said earlier, again, another trend here at Strata that we're going to highlight is that the word data processing is a term that's been kicked around uh, and, and amplified in a relevant way. That's an old term, Dave. We can go back and remember, you know, data processing is an IT term in the glass house days of mainframe and kind of got diluted with client server and PC because there's a lot of, you know, you know, distributed data. But now, the notion of data processing is really, really a big deal. So IBM has their finger on the pulse of data processing and that tweet chat, they assembled some really smart people on that tweet chat um, and Wikibon was really on there uh, contributing a lot as value as well. And they understand the issues around governance. So they, they're dealing with all these issues. Now we're here at Strata on the emerging side dealing with the developer side, but it's clear they see this trend as developer friendly, multi mashup data sets as a real big thing, not a siloed approach. Uh, well, and I think IBM has, was very impressed with the fact that they get it. Well, I, mean, I think from IBM's standpoint, the business model is is really about taking technologies that are in a huge, massive, like ridiculously large portfolio and making them work through services. I mean, we know from studying this business that services is almost half, about half of the opportunity, the revenue opportunity from the, the, the TAM perspective. And we all know who's the, the whale in yeah. services, IBM now. So a lot of people look at that and say, you know, Scott McNeil used to say services is, is where companies go to die. <laughs> well, I think a lot Which of people. Kind of ironic, I think, I think what's interesting <laughs> about this marketplace is that it's so explosive that it's still not yeah. yet. There's no standard general purpose platform in big data. There's no data fabric. There's a lot of land grabbing going on. But more importantly, a lot of those paradigms in the past really do are relevant. I mean, uh, Ed talked about the semantic web is going to be a 20 year project. But data, data quality is a database challenge. It's just going to be viewed in a different lens. And my comment was earlier, uh, dirty data is a bad user experience. Well, so, so these are really, we talked to the gentleman from Berkeley last night, and we were talking about the hard problems, and I gave him the example of speed of light. He says, oh, we can solve for that algorithmically, and of course Google has done that with Spanner. Uh, but, and, and we heard Ed say the real hard problems are you know, organizational, data organization, data management. Those are the really tough problems. So my, my point I want to make about services is that it's all about, as Ed Dumbbell was saying, it's all about the business value. If you can go into an organization and demonstrate clear business value, and you can show them a path you know, to, to achieve that business value, they'll pay through the nose for that, and that's really what well, services but, is all about. Yeah, but Dave, here's the problem in this market right now, and so again, to kind of up-level this in this terms of this marketplace, you know, a lot of the fragmentation around putting out new distributions is a stall tactic, right, in my mind. People are trying to catch up in a growing market. It's like putting a big rock on the river. The water's going to flow around that, that rock, and so the innovation is going to come from places um, no one's ever seen before, and what Ed brings up is that the, the own IT department and corporations' own governance issues is the bottleneck. That's why we're seeing shadow data emerge because you know, there's not, the, the data issues in the company is very complex. So companies are not going to be aggressively deploying new data paradigms. Well, so privacy, the, security. So I think Intel's got a good bet that there's going to be years on the security side and on the performance side. So you know, I see corporations lagging on the adoption of new data approaches. So, because of the governance issues, because of the lawsuits and compliance, and what's going to force is a shadow data market. So I expect the innovation is going to come in from 
new approaches. Yeah, well, so we're sort of jumping back between topics, the Hadoop distribution and the, and the data management, they're related. And the shadow IT piece is actually interesting because it's just, <laughs> it's a nightmare from a data governance standpoint, yeah. right? It's, yeah, can you imagine, IT, hey, I want to put all our data in the cloud and yeah. I want to do this really kick-ass mobile app and uh, no. Well, that's why the <laughs> Intel distro was interesting to me. When I first heard, actually a couple months ago, that Intel was getting to readying a distro, I had no details and I was like, Really? I wonder what that's all about, why? I couldn't like, sort through the angle, and of course started thinking about it, and, and the security piece to me is the most interesting there, especially when you start thinking about internet, internet of Things. You need a whole new security model, and I think, as we've talked about many times, it, uh, security is in a way a do-over, and the way Intel is doing it over is the right way. Well, we're here, I'm going to come back on our next segment soon, but just other, other things in the news, Google continues to pimp up their single sign-on uh, with Google+, Plus. Uh, a new startup backed by Peter Thiel, Thinkful, personalized education platform. Again, not talked about here, we should, we're trying to find some folks to drill down on this, but education is going to be disrupted by big data. We're seeing it with Khan Academy. Uh, you'll see it in a variety of other solutions. Learning will be impacted just like everything else. And uh, antitrust proceedings uh, in the works against the nation's cable companies possibly signaling the end of pay TV. Again, Netflix was highlighted here. LinkedIn was talking about big data. Big data is going to be a lever of innovation from TV to applications to governance. Uh, and Dave, it's exciting. So, uh, a great time to be in big data, and, and whoever said big data is dead, um, that was Venture Beat. Ed, Ed pointed out, um, is really, really off base. So, um, <laughs> we're here on the ground covering it. Obviously, uh, big data is what was our wheelhouse. Wikibon, you have the, the most research out there. Uh, go to wikibon.org for more research. We'll be right back with our next segment here on our primetime news hour at Strata Conference Day Two. all the programs out there and identified a gap in tech news coverage. Those shows are just the tip of the iceberg and we're here for the deep dive. The market begged for our program to fill that void. We're not just touting off headlines, we also want to analyze the big picture and ask the questions that no one else is asking. We work with analysts who know the industry from the inside out. So what do you think was the source of this missing? So you mentioned briefly uh, there are... If that's the case, then why does the world need another software? We're creating service? a fundamental change in news coverage, laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning. Good morning, I'm Kristen Folletti and welcome to News Desk on SiliconANGLE TV for Wednesday, February 27th, 2013. Kim.com and Apple have two very different approaches when it comes to email. Here to discuss the latest trends in cloud services is SiliconANGLE contributing editor, John Casaretto. Good morning, John. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. We've discussed .com and his mega service on the show before, and with its launch in January, Kim.com's mega has been open to the public for a while now. The cloud storage site offers more than a place to host your files, but also gives each user a personal email account. .com has recently announced plans to incorporate end-to-end -end encryption for the email service, specifically saying, we're going to extend this to secure email, which is fully encrypted, so that you won't have to worry that a government or internet service provider will be looking at your email. John, why do you think .com wants to offer this encrypted email service to users? Well, I think that there's a number of others, uh, a number of people that worry about a government or a company or internet service provider that's going to be looking at your mail. So for those that are concerned about privacy, .com sees this as an opportunity to, to provide a service that, uh, that people want. Uh, you know, we know about the recent Google uh, situation where they provided countless emails over to the government without so much as even a warrant. Um, so, and, and this goes on all the time. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There's many others that likely do the same, it just hasn't come to light yet. Since Mega's launch in January, it now has more than 3 million registered users who have stored a total of 125 million files in the first month of operation. According to Kim.com, it took competitor Dropbox two years to achieve that. 
Why do you think Mega has had such a successful launch? Do you think it's because of Kim.com's massive free storage offering of 50 gigs? Or is there more that users are finding appealing about his philosophy on cloud storage? What's your opinion? Well, I think it's been a number of things. I think that there was a lot of curiosity when the service was first announced with much pomp and circumstance. Um, you know, th they gained quite a bit of notoriety uh, more than more than ever since all of this stuff happened, since, you know, the shutdown of the original Mega. Um, so, you know, a lot of people interested in, in what's going on and, and what this service is. And uh, I think that, that many people, however, I think the, the what's really happening is a lot of people are concerned about the privacy of their files. But, you know, you're right, the, the storage offering is certainly something that's attracting people. The, the cloud storage philosophies, they, they have to help. I think that it's just, you know, it's a whole mix of things that are bringing people over to this mega, and these announcements are constant, and it seems like they're, they're quickly evolving and, you know, trying to, to find a user base, and, and they're finding it. Speaking in London on Tuesday, Francis Moore, the chief executive of the IFPI, which represents record labels internationally, said that the move against .com's former file sharing service, Mega Upload, has had a positive effect, saying action by governments and courts have had a major impact and cloud locker services have seen a major reduction in traffic since the action against Kim.com. John, what's your reaction to Moore's statement? Do you believe the action taken against Kim.com has overall had a positive or a negative impact on the cloud community? Well, uh, clearly Moore has, has access to information that we don't. So, you know, we have to take that at face value and just kind of look at what he's saying and, and kind of talk about that. But, you know, I, I think that there was probably an attrition of some casual users for sure. Um, but there's been a lot of spreading into other services as well. I, I, I would have to estimate that the community is probably back on the upswing at this point. What, while, you know, whatever statistics he's looking at from whatever point of reference and, or period of time that he's referring to, we just don't know, really know what, that, what he's really talking about there. Um, so we have to take that with a grain of salt. In a contrasting move from Mega's secure email system, Apple is decreasing the privacy in their iCloud service in order to prohibit its use for activities they deem inappropriate. Their new measures include a system that audits emails for specific language and will interpret the email's transmission if the email includes language that Apple has declared unsavory. John, do you think this policy will have an effect on iCloud users? Well, I think absolutely. Anytime uh, privacy is lost, that, that's a tough thing for people to accept, um, especially when it comes to light in a very public way. Um, and some may find that unsettling. The question is, you know, why is Apple interrupting these email transmissions as, as you know, that they, they catch these things coming out? You know, was it an attempt to prevent spam or are they actually censoring materials? Uh, it, it's hard to say. We've talked time and time again about how important it is that users read the terms of service. Technically, what Apple is doing is completely within their bounds, but at what point is it invasion of privacy to have a system which scans your emails and automatically emits content they find inappropriate, even though the messages could be completely legitimate? Well, I think that's a great question for the community to ask. Um, you know, what is acceptable? You know, what's the, the limit here? Do, do you want your messages filtered for content? I mean, if it's spam, that's one thing. The mechanisms are quite often very much the same. And I think that uh, when you when you think about your, your provider of email, um, you know, how do, they, how do they address that as far as, you know, their official policy? And, you know, that's the thing that we're looking at is, you know, this, this whole question of, uh, you know what are what are the terms of service? Go through, read those things, and just figure out. You know, is there is there any type of uh, filtering that that you're not comfortable with? Do you think this is an honest attempt by Apple to remove spam from their system, or in trying to project an image, are they forcing users to stay clean or opt out of their service? What's your take? Well, you know that's that's the thing. Uh, you know, I. I th Personally, I think that uh, this is probably an attempt at blocking out spam, this particular incident that has brought this to light. But, you know, it raises a good question that Apple simply just hasn't answered yet. You know, do they aim to, to have some kind of uh, censorship or message control, or is this, you know, truly a spam tactic that was just happened to get caught in this particular incident? 
Thinking back to Instagram's terms of service issues that we've discussed on the show, consumers obviously want ownership over their content. We know that. Do you think companies like Apple will see consumer pushback due to this, especially with services like Mega offering the polar opposite, a completely private and encrypted email service? You know, uh, that's a great question, and it opens up it opens up the, the debate of whether Mega, you know, could it be used for spam and other types of email abuse? Um, you know, that's the other side of the of the coin there, um, freedom versus abuse. You know, Mega has traditionally run in a way that you know, that they're not accountable, that they've sought out that pocket of legality and culpability, and, and they count on that gray area to operate. Um, you know, I, I think that in the end, um, I think that we'll see that Apple, you know, co comes out of this saying, hey, you know, we, we do some filtering, um, or, it, you know, it was just the spam incident. And, you know, the pushback, I mean, I think Apple's popularity and the, the amount of uh, abilities that people have to take email with them on the go and on their MacBooks and this and that. I think that they'll look uh, past this because most people, quite frankly, don't behave and you know have certain phrases that that would be caught, and most people would probably not even really notice. Well, John, it's definitely been a very interesting conversation this morning. Thanks so much for taking the time with us. Thank you. And your social angle daily news roundup is next here on Silicon Angle TV. We looked at all the programs out there and identified a gap in tech news coverage. Those shows are just the tip of the iceberg and we're here for the deep dive. The market begged for our program to fill that void. We're not just touting off headlines, we also want to analyze the big picture and ask the questions that no one else is asking. We work with analysts who know the industry from the inside out. So what do you think was the source of this missing? So you mentioned briefly uh, there are... If that's the case, then why does the world need another software We're creating service? a fundamental change in news coverage, laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning. Welcome back to Strata Conference. This is Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of Riley Media Strata Conference. This is our one hour news uh, breaking analysis, a concept that we've introduced early in the year. We, we take the breaking news and we analyze it. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, joined with Wookie Bond analyst Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly to break down the news here on day two and uh, in aggregate to the show. Uh, Jeff Kelly, I want to ask you about the uh, uh, the Hadoop distribution market in particular right now, obviously the hot top story, and then we're going to get to business value, but let's, let's talk about what's going on with the Hadoop distribution market. We sat down with Wan, Disco, and a variety of other, other companies, AMC and others. What's your take on, on, the, uh, on, on the thing? Dave, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so Jeff, you, you were talking to Wan, Disco, you were talking to uh, 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 Hortonworks. Now, Wan, Disco announced the Hadoop distribution uh, focused on uh, active, active, high availability, really trying to solve the problem of, uh, of, of mission criticality within Hadoop. Uh, Hortonworks, you know, other end of the spectrum, totally open source, really trying to, to push that. So what's your take on these two companies? And then you can introduce the segment. Sure, well, uh, you know, there's different approaches to making Hadoop enterprise ready. That's one of the keys to uh, this market. The other, of course, is adding uh, some of that functionality, that SQL-like functionality into, into Hadoop to make it more accessible to business users. And of course, just, uh, you know, there's things like security and of course, uh, making contributions back to the open source community. So these are some of the topics we talked about. Uh, went out to, onto the floor. Um, when Disco in particular uh, was focused on really the, the non-stop name node, that's really their innovation, uh, taking the active active data replication technology that they've been applying uh, across the WAN with their customers for years, applying that now to Hadoop uh, with their acquisition of Alpha Store, and they've got their own distribution to do that. 
Um, we've got a demonstration uh, really showing a very, actually kind of dramatic, uh, running, running Hadoop um, live. It killed one of the name nodes and you can see, you can see dramatically the, the activity drop off and another name node just picks right up. All right, so up. watch this, watch Jeff, Jeff Kelly doing the booth crawl uh, on, on the show floor here at Strato. We're right back. Hi everybody, this is Jeff Kelly from the Wikibon Project. I'm here at the Santa Clara Convention Center where Strata Conference 2013 is taking place this week. Uh, we're about to head out and talk to HP, Hortonworks, Wendisco, and Data Direct Networks about what's going on in the Hadoop market. Specifically, we're going to touch on the Hadoop distribution wars which are really heating up. And of course, the question on everyone's mind is Hadoop Enterprise ready? My name is Konstantin Budnik. I joined Wendisco about six weeks ago from Karmasphere. And before that, I was doing uh, Hadoop development at Yahoo and uh, uh, Cloudera. And uh, in OneDisco, I'm in charge of uh, Hadoop distribution, OneDisco Hadoop distribution, which is uh, not simply yet another Hadoop distribution, but an engine that allows us to deliver a very interesting uh, bleeding, bleeding edge, I would say, technologies to, to, to the Hadoop market. And these technologies are namely non-stop name node with my co uh, colleague Constantine will talk about a little bit later and uh, um, a technology that allows you to use um, Hadoop clusters for um, uh, private cloud. So basically the applications that are run on S3, technology, uh, S3 file system from Amazon could be seamlessly transferred to uh, Vandiska distribution using our proprietary S3 HDFS bridge. Um, among the other, and, uh, other advancements we, we put into the Hadoop distribution is a much better uh, user experience for, for cluster users. And uh, the main thing is that we are the first pretty much uh, commercial company that provides Hadoop 2 um, uh, support and Hadoop 2 based distribution of uh, the, the, the full Hadoop, Hadoop stack. So we are fully committed to open source. Um, we using uh, another Apache pro project called Big Top that I am one of the co-authors actually uh, to build a distribution. And uh, as, a, as a shameless plug, uh, we've built the, the full distribution from ground zero to the working commercial product in just 28 days using um, open source technologies, Big Top particularly. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so what we have here is the industry's first multiple active name node solution for HDFS. And we have three name nodes serving the entire data space. So what we're going to do is start TerraSort, the clients are going to connect to all three of the name nodes. Then we're going to kill one of the name nodes. We'll see Terrasort continue, fine, no interruptions. We'll see the other two name nodes pick up the load, and we'll see the dead name node flatline, basically. That's the demo. OK, what we have here are uh, three graphics applications showing the activity in each of the name nodes. They're showing um, RPC bytes in and bytes out. I've prepped it so we already have TerraGen data in the in the HDFS. I'm going to run TerraSort now, and we'll see the activity pick up. In the next few minutes, we'll see activity on the name nodes pick up. There we go. The orange lines indicate bytes sent, and the green lines are bytes received by the name nodes. Let's give it a few minutes to get really active. Then we'll go and do the unthinkable, which is to kill one of the name nodes. That's a catastrophic failure in most HDFS. In our solution, we simply switch to the other two name nodes, and life goes on. TerraSort is uninterrupted. Excellent. So obviously, you guys have been, been uh, putting a lot of hard work into this. Um, you know, as we kind of look forward uh, to the rest of the year, what are kind of what's on your roadmap in terms of uh, initial uh, development you're looking to add to the to the product? We have planned for a world file system. This is HDFS that runs across multiple data centers. The result is a single namespace that's spread across multiple data centers, and you can run your jobs on whichever data center is near your uh, data. The result is something like, if you have a data center go down or multiple data centers go down, you can still have access to your data, and you can still run your jobs. That's coming up next. We also have plans to use our active-active replication technology for the YARN resource manager and for the HBase master. Excellent. All right, great. Well, guys, obviously a lot more coming from Windisco this year, so keep your eyes peeled for what they're doing. 
Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, signing off. I'm here at Stratic Conference with Jim Walker at the Hortonworks booth. Uh, Jim is a product manager for Hortonworks. Welcome. Uh, good morning, Jeff. How are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, so obviously a lot of news happening here at the show. Uh, Hortonworks among the uh, among the companies really releasing some interesting things. Yep. Uh, one thing uh, recently was the the Stinger project. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So Stinger is really. Uh, it's, it's an initiative, I guess, if you will, within the Hive community. So Apache Hive has really been uh, the de facto standard for SQL interaction with, with Hadoop for years, right? It uh, originally came out of Facebook, I guess, in about the 2008 time frame, uh, placed in the open community so that the community could build it out. And that's really kind of the genesis of SQL interaction. There's been a lot of conversation about SQL the past Oh God, a couple months, right, Jeff? So, uh, so within the community itself, you know, we really kind of led an initiative to kind of lead a, a couple of different prong attack to really speed up Hive. You know, Hive is great for uh, kind of batch processing. You know, everybody thinks of Hadoop as batch processing, all these things. You know, so people are using Hive to do things like dashboarding or kind of, you know, uh, the, the use cases that don't need instant kind of human interactive timeframes, yeah? So really our approach is to really embrace Hive and let's, let's fix Hive so that it can move into the more interactive use cases. And so that's really what the Stinger initiative is all about. And it's really about kind of optimizing the engine within Hive. Um, it's about optimizing the way the data is stored. We have something called the optimized RC file, which is the file that lays in there. I know Owen O'Malley on our team working with a lot of guys at Facebook and again, the, the wider community to actually bring this to, uh, to the market and bring it to the community, really. Uh, so you know you mentioned a few partners, Microsoft among them. So obviously uh, you know partnering is a, is a core part of your strategy, and, yep. and it goes right along with the open source nature of HTTP. So why don't you talk to us about really the philosophy behind that open nature yeah. and why that's so important to what you guys are doing? Yeah. So open source is hugely important, Jeff. And you know I've been in this open source space for quite some time. You know I think what's different here at Hortonworks is really we think about it as more of an open community. And I think the term open community better describes what Hadoop is really all about. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an ex-developer, right? And so I'm really proud that I'm in a space where developer is king. You know, there's, this, uh, there's kind of a little bit of a match in terms of who has the committers to Hadoop, right? Because, you know, that core bit, the, the bits are being developed by a bunch of guys and they all work together and they're all friendly and that's all fantastic. And we're all building companies on top of this stuff. And so, you know, I'm really proud of that. But, you know, we, we, when I take a step back and talk about the ecosystem and how this all comes together, you know, it comes down to, you know, our fundamental difference in the way that we go to business and the way that we think about what we're doing is, you know, our job is to make sure that we understand the enterprise and we gather the requirements that are necessary for widespread adoption, you know, and either by talking with customers, by working with the, the distribu you know, the, the projects that have already been using uh, Hortonworks data platform, and, and then the experience of our team, you know, the operations experience at Yahoo, uh, you know, the data science guys that, that have been working on this for years, understanding those requirements and then taking those requirements and putting them into the open community. You know, we really believe the fastest path to innovation is that open community. And if you put the right requirements into that funnel, what comes out the other end is just really stable, reliable, and, and quite honestly, vetted across a wider community. So you think about like, you know, like the Stinger stuff we were talking about, right? It's, uh, you know, it's Facebook, it's us, it's Microsoft. It's a bunch of different people involved, not just Hortonworks, right? We really feel that, you know, I mean, the stuff that we can do in that, that engine is really, really fast. And then, you know, quite honestly, the third bit of this is, we have a responsibility. If we're going to talk about the enterprise, we're going to be enterprise to do, we need to apply enterprise rigor to our distribution. So, you know, stable, reliable, rock solid distribution is absolutely what we're all about. It's about making sure we have the most stable releases across all the projects, right, that make up a distribution. You know, version one, of course, we're working on version two. The fact, you know, that we aren't going to bring out version two until we know that it's stable and reliable. And we're going to know because we're testing it at Yahoo. You know, Yahoo's an investment partner, but they're also a development partner. And, uh, you know, that's huge for us because when we come out with a new version of our distribution every three months, by the way, our quarterly cadence, you know, we're testing on 400, 600 nodes at, at Yahoo. And that just really allows us to, to do some things with the, the software that, I, you know, it's not really easy to do. And that's a, it's a huge, huge benefit to us and really the, the overall community, I think. So, and they're, they're hell bent on, on, you know, making sure that, that Hadoop is stable and reliable and, use ride spread. So that's, I mean, that's really what we're all about. All right, fantastic. Well, those are some great conversations. Thanks so much to Hortonworks, HP, DDN, and Wendisco for their insights on Hadoop and the evolving landscape. Dave and John, now back to you. Okay, we're back here live at the Strata Conference. This is SiliconANGLE's uh, news hour. We're uh, blanket coverage here at uh, 
at the Strata Conference of Raleigh Media, and we're with Lebon analyst uh, Dave Vellante, chief researcher, and big data research analyst Jeff Kelly. Jeff, you're out on the floor digging into all the, all the data. Uh, what can you share? What did you learn on the floor out there today? Well, uh, you know, in addition to uh, when Disco's you just saw, we spoke with Hortonworks as well, and they're doing some really interesting things around uh, bringing that SQL-like access to Hadoop. Of course, that's a big theme this week. Um, really bringing that kind of SQL-like capability to Hadoop really opens up the platform to a lot more developers as well as, I should say, a lot more business users as well as uh, more traditional business intelligence type tools. Uh, so Hortonworks is working on uh, really uh, making Hive enterprise ready to, to take on that job and with something called the Stinger Initiative, uh, which we just heard a little bit about. So doing some very interesting things and of course they're really focused on that open source uh, strategy when it comes to partnering and, and on the technology itself. So really, the, some really interesting things. What's the general sentiment on the show floor in general? I'll actually, DataStack's got a really cool booth in there. Cassandra's obviously another part of the big data survey. What other things are you seeing out there on the floor? What's the activity like? Well, again, I think it's it's tracking very closely to the things we've been talking about. Um, you know, this is, it's really interesting to be out there when you've got, uh, you know, it's, it's a collegial atmosphere, but at the same time there is some tension growing, as you can tell. This is really turning into a shooting war. Uh, when it comes to Hadoop and, and the whole SQL uh, aspect of it. Uh, you know, you've got Intel next to Greenplum, who just made competing announcements, uh, next to Cloudera and Hortonworks and Wendisco with their distribution. So it's really, uh, you know, everyone's uh, kind of smiling on the surface, but you can tell there's some real competition happening now. Um, there's a lot of money to be made, and clearly this is a real market. There's no question about that. What's some feedback? We have 20 seconds. Feedback you're getting on your market's uh, sizing, uh, second uh, research reports, free at wikibon.org mm -hmm. slash big data. Um, obviously, um, another groundbreaking report. What's the general feedback? Uh, overall, you know, happy to say the feedback's been positive. I think uh, the, the market is really looking for this kind of information, um, which is really why Dave and I decided to, to undertake this last year. Um, but you know, overall, it's been positive feedback. You know, there's some question around. I think the biggest, the biggest, the most controversial part of it is, uh, of course, how do you define big data? Um, what are the parameters to include when you're uh, including revenue from larger companies where only a small portion of their, de their revenue is big data? So that's kind of been the most controversial part. So the feedback part. I, be, I get is thanks for all that great research for free. That's, that's <laughs> what people tell me. <laughs> uh, you guys do some great work. Okay, we'll be right back with our uh, next guest. We'll be a deep dive, Steve Kennison, Storage Alchemist coming on to do a deep dive on the storage implications and storage innovation because big data would be nothing without the storage, fast storage, cold storage, hot storage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, without storage, you can't do what, what the people are doing here. So, a lot of new technology to look at, uh, and that's going to be a key part of the next segment. We'll be right back after this short break. We looked at all the programs out there and identified a gap in tech news coverage. Those shows are just the tip of the iceberg, and we're here for the deep dive. The market begged for our program to fill that void. We're not just touting off headlines. We also want to analyze the big picture and ask the questions that no one else is asking. We work with analysts who know the industry from the inside out. So what do you think was the source of this missing? So you mentioned briefly uh, there are... If that's the case, then why does the world need another software? We're creating a fundamental change in news coverage, laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning. Hey, welcome back. This is a Strata Conference, O'Reilly Media's uh, exclusive coverage uh, with SiliconANGLE Wikibon. I'm John Furrier, I'm, I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and this is a special deep dive segment. We're here with the storage alchemist, who is uh, Steve Keniston. Steve's actually with IBM, but, uh, but he's here. He's a longtime friend of theCUBE. Uh, really has, uh, used to be an independent analyst and, and brings that perspective. He's been at the show, crawling around, talking to practitioners, talk, talking to technologists, former CTO, um, and uh, Steve, thanks for coming on. Thanks a lot, Dave, I appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, I think this is your first Strata, right? This is my first Strata. So what do you think? I mean, what have you seen? Maybe give us the, the, the take from the show. We get the deep dives on theCUBE, 
but we don't spend as much time you know, in, the, in the side sessions as you have. Yeah, Dave, so I think it's really interesting. You know, I, I came here with, uh, again, it being my first strata, not having a lot of expectations and trying to understand you know, where the world is going with big data. My approach has really been from the, uh, the aspect of what's the hardware side look like? What is, what is the, you know, we see, you see EMC, you see NetApp, you see a lot of the vendors talking about the big iron that it's going to take to kind of drive big data and what, what it's going to take. And, um, you know, I really wanted to understand that and understand what the, what the technologies were, the underlying technologies and data storage technologies were going to be for that. I haven't heard a lot about that at the show, you know, this year. What I've been hearing a lot of is, is what's the software, how is the data going to really be valuable to your organization, how do you extract the value from it, where does the data go, how does it live, where does it die, um, what's the governance of that data. Uh, a lot of that, but not a lot around the uh, the where is it stored and how do I manage that. The data management of big data, I think, is going to be very crucial to how IT shops actually then turn that information set over to the the, the folks that need to consume that and actually extract the value. It's, it's going to be difficult. Well, you mentioned software. I mean, you're seeing everything as software-led, right? I mean, we've been talking about that a lot, and it, it sounds like that's exactly what you're seeing at this event. Exactly. There's, it's been all about the the software components that actually help you suck the data from the different uh, the different. Uh, you know, open source communities, pull it into some, some data repository and then go apply the analysis on top of that. Um, you know, and, and, and it's very interesting, this whole software-led X, whether, whether it be software-led infrastructure, software-led storage, um, you're hearing more and more about the capabilities, and I always talk about the storage services, the value components that, that sit on top of the spinning, I, I, IBM doesn't necessarily always like it, but I call it the spinning rust, right? But at the end of the day, it's the software that adds the value, and we're hearing a lot more about the software, uh, these software applications or software capabilities that, for example, like inside of Hadoop or MapR, having things like snapshotting capabilities, replication capabilities, now if that's the case, do I want to spend for an expensive storage way? Well, in some cases you do, right? From a performance standpoint, or or from a security standpoint, or from a uh, you know speed of getting things done standpoint. But if I can, if, if it, I know it's going to grow exponentially, so hard, so fast, and I really want to control my costs, where do I end up spending my money? I, I want to spend it in the valuable stuff, and that typically ends up being the software. So I, I mean, you've worked at some big iron companies, right? I mean, IBM you could, is obviously. That sells a lot of big iron. EMC, EMC sells a lot of big iron. Uh, you've also worked at some software companies. You were at Veritas uh, and others. So what do you think? I mean, we've seen for the last you know, couple of decades, uh, the industry has marked up Seagate disk drives, right? And, but the value has been in the software, but that software's been locked inside of the, the, the array, for example. So what do you see happening going forward? How do companies continue to thrive and continue to you know, get the types of margins that they've been used to, or does that go away? I think you know you hear a lot more about the commoditization of, of everything and, and the commoditization of data, the commoditization of software, but more importantly, you're hearing about the com more and more about the commoditization of the hardware, right? The commodity hardware is becoming where I start to, especially in the big data world, where I start to deploy a lot of my applications and extract a lot of the value from from the data. It's not the spinning it's not the spinning disks that actually sit on the floor. So I think I think you have to play this balance. You play this balance between getting the margins you can from the value that's in the software and uh, uh, you know, offsetting it from the value or the, or the margins that you're not going to make necessarily in the hardware. So is it the case that the, uh, the traditional storage guys are, are not here in force because they're not selling their hardware and they haven't figured this model out yet? Is that a different part of the organization that has to figure that stuff out? I mean, for instance, obviously Greenplum's here in a big way. Um, is, is that what companies have to do, is to sort of transform themselves to take advantage of that software-led infrastructure or get crushed? No, I do think there needs to be a little bit of a transformation, a, a, a big transformation. So, you know, you think about the fact that, uh, you know, data protection, and we've talked a lot about data protection in the past. You talk about data protection capabilities slowly moving into the software, but at the end of the day, I need some back-end repository in order to be able to store that. Well, the question is, maybe, maybe for data protection it's kind of an offshoot, but, but when I store that information, where is it going? Dave Floyer, um, Wikibon analyst, right, wrote a great piece called Flape, right? It's this combination of flash storage, right, and tape. 
So tape is very inexpensive. Uh, it's an inexpensive media for storing vast amounts of information, and then you have flash, which is really important for extracting the value out of your, your big data repository in a very, very fast manner. So if I can then move what might be then stale information to that secondary repository, right, with some, with some smart software, I still need to invest in that secondary repository. And then that brings to light the question, all right, so now I have flash-based um, capabilities sitting up front on all flash array, for example, where I can really start to leverage and extract the value from the software. So before you say, you know, do the vendors really need to start to understand or kind of worry about them themselves that are selling the big iron get taken out, I don't necessarily think that's the case. We've all seen technology kind of evolve, you know, and the next evolution is going to be, for example, these all flash arrays. How, it's, it's now becoming, and, and again, David Floyer wrote a nice piece about this, where these all flash arrays can be so much less expensive when trying to drive you know, big data or, or data that sits on, you know, under, uh, on top of a database. Uh, you know, it can be a lot less expensive to run it in an all flash array versus perhaps maybe running it in, in a spinning disk array, right? So, so now you're going to see these transformations start to take place combined with software and then how do I continue to leverage the, soft, the, the hardware in the back end, for example, like tape. And we've heard a lot about in-memory databases this week, John, and, and Flash is obviously playing a role for metadata and Well, I mean, fast I think, Dave, what, what's here is interesting, what, what uh, Sorge Alchemist is kind of teasing out here is, uh, and, and Steve, is, is that software-led is a thesis that we've put forth, uh, Wikibon in particular wrote the first research paper, again, another seminal moment in groundbreaking research from Wikibon, um, that's not software defined. It's not, because it's not defined. Software defined networking, software defined infrastructure is where everyone's going. It's certainly not defined, so I think software led's a better term, but here, um, appliances are kind of passe, although DDN is more of a higher end one on HPC, which totally makes sense, but in general, the storage equation is interesting. Software's a big, big, big part of it, but no one's talking about some of the things like compression, and we've had these conversations with Steve before, and you know the storage aspect is really, really impactful here because developers just want it to work, right? They don't want to deal with under the covers BS around you know management and dealing with data transformations and different data sets working differently because of some proprietary hook. So, Steve, I want to ask you that on, on that comment on that from a perspective of you know storage should be just a, a place where data goes, but the latency and throughput are huge issues, right? You got virtualization out there, you got some compression. How do you look at the latency and the throughput issue? Some are claiming great performances and saying, but they're not counting latency. The throughput numbers are great, but latency's horrible, right, so. Yeah, I think what you're seeing is, is uh, what we're hearing a lot about, and um, I think you brought up a very good point, John, right? At the end of the day, what is the customer looking for, right? And at the end of the day, they don't want to have to deal with all the integration components. I think about 10 years ago, I was an analyst with the Enterprise Strategy Group. And we talked about, and that's when the IBM SPC platform was originally launched, okay, so 10 years ago. The first thing everybody came out and started talking about is, hey, this is a really great set of capabilities. It would be awesome if we had a disk array or a set of, or a set of disk shelves that were underneath it so that it was just easy to all manage in one set, one, one um, you know, kind of block of, of, of capabilities. Now what's happening, you're starting to see that smart software, for example, be extracted further into a platform like an SVC, and now it's heterogeneous. So now I can do all the things that I really want to do, one simple set of management capabilities sitting on top of all of my disk, and then I can make the, the more difficult decision. So now I say, okay, now what am I looking for? As a consumer, I'm now looking for performance. Well, if I can virtualize everything underneath that, under, uh, if I can virtualize all of my storage and have my flash also play a part of that entire virtualization tree, and then migrate data down to my lower, lower cost storage, I can control my costs, it's simple to manage, right, which is what consumers want, and it's all, and I'm getting the, the performance that, that I require. And, and at the end of the day, John, you're exactly right. When it comes to, when it, when it comes to this big data thing, <coughs> speed is going to be your, end up being your competitive advantage, right? So if I can get better performance, and I'm going to need that better performance to get that answer sooner, to make that business decision sooner, to get that data so that I can drive my business, that's what I'm looking for. What have been some of the most interesting conversations that you've heard in the marketplace out here in the hallways? I mean, obviously, 
you know, O'Reilly Media is uh, known for having really amazing thought leadership conferences. Obviously, um, the program is phenomenal. A lot of alpha geeks, but now you have the you know bottoms up community growing fast, top down, and, and, and all the actions kind of happening at the intersection of that. Um, but it's the hallway conversation that people want to know about. Okay, what are you hearing? So I think uh, actually I want to take it from a different perspective. I want to talk about a little bit about what I'm not hearing about, right? So what I'm actually not hearing about is the fact that if we take a step back and we look at how cloud really evolved, right? Cloud was this concept, and then a lot of the big iron folks they got involved in cloud, and then they started selling cloud to very large vendors, right? So big companies were deploying cloud, and then now you're starting to see three, four, or five years later, it's trickling down to the small to medium enterprise. And at the end of the day, when you when you kind of break apart all the all the fanciness and you figure out what does cloud really mean, you hear it means like I need agility in my business, I need flexibility, I need scalability. Well, I think big data is the opposite. And what I'm not hearing is, is I'm hearing a lot of, the, uh, of, you know, big data is huge, it's big, it's massive, I need to extract information, I need to figure all this out. But what I'm not hearing about is the fact, so let's take a quick example. I was just in Vietnam about uh, three months ago. And they asked me, what were you here to speak about? And I said, I'm here to speak about big data. And they said, well, we don't really have big data here in Vietnam. We're, we're a small country and we're not collecting a lot of information. But the reality is, is people just don't understand of all these open APIs, I actually have the ability to suck in important pieces of content, munge that with some of my business analysis tools that I have already, maybe my, my sales database, and extract some real value from that. And it doesn't have to be hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of information, it can be a few terabytes of information. So I would really like to see, and I'm not hearing this, but I, I actually really believe, and I did hear a little bit of this walking around, is that I think small companies who take advantage of big data uh, you know, the concept of big data and utilizing big data and utilizing that information to make business, better business decisions can really compete. Small banks could now really compete with folks like, you know, Bank of America or Citibank and actually, you know, I don't want to say do damage, but actually, you know, grow and be very successful um, because they, they understand a lot about their businesses. They understand a lot about their customers, that sort of thing. You said to me last night that one of the things you heard at the conference is that, that you sense that so, some marketeers at large organizations, certain large organizations, are afraid of big data. Um, on the other hand, you have this meme of how the CMO is going to outspend the CIO in big data. So what did you mean by that and, 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 and where did that come from? So I heard a really interesting conversation, or a really interesting presentation from someone from Accenture, right? So Accenture, you know, you were just talking in your last segment a little bit about the fact that um, services, oh, and yeah. services led, right? right. That, that's pretty big. Well, Accenture is really all about services. But they, they had some statistics about the fact that you can go out and gather all of this information, and a lot of this information is being driven by IT. So you might have a line of business manager come in and they might start talking a little bit about, you know, okay, we've helped you, we've collected this information, then they hand that data over, but, you know, okay, I, I've got this information, but I wasn't necessarily the one. The, you know, the, the, market, the marketeer wasn't the one asking the question to the data set. So now I've got some answers, but I don't really know what to do with those answers. So I quickly have to retreat to what I know best and just go do my, my marketing project. So I do think there's a lot of services that need to be involved to help folks ask better questions of that data set in order to be able to then turn that into real value and make decisions using that information. So you also said that you feel like startups are in a better position to leverage big data. So what, what did you mean by that and what are you seeing? I think startups have a lot of, a lot of flexibility. I think they have a lot of, um, a lot of innovation and I think they actually have, they know better what questions that they want to ask to, to data sets and they know what data sets they want to go out and collect to then ask that, that, that question to then move their business to the next level. Whereas I think big corporations kind of get sedentary and kind of stuck in their ways. They don't necessarily always know what to ask. Okay, Steve, final comment. I want you, we're going to break here and end our news hour, power hour here. Um, final comment, make it brief, bumper sticker, um, storage innovation here at Strata. Uh, what's happening and what needs to be worked on? Give us your quick sound bite. I really want to see what we can do in the $150,000 range, sub $150,000 range to implement a solution, and if that's from a hardware standpoint, to implement a solution for small to medium sized businesses to be able to be super competitive in this highly competitive world where it's just not all about the cash. It's really about being, being flexible and about being knowledgeable. 
Okay, this is Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage. That's our uh, Power Hour prime time here, 12 to 1. At every CUBE event, you'll see us. We're going to break down the news analysis for one hour, and that's going to be the full package. And then we'll back to our in depth blanket coverage day to day. This is day two of day three days of wall to wall coverage, uh, 9 to 5 every day, live here at Strata Conference, co produced with O'Reilly Media. This is the CUBE, Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the event, extract the signal from the noise. We'll be right back with our next spotlight segments after the short break.